I do this stuff for the fans because I want them to enjoy it. And so we try to come up with as much stuff as we can, as many hidden things as we, as we can to, to really give the true fans you know, things to look for when they're there. That is Eric Baker, and you're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Thanks for joining me here on episode 230 of the Tomorrow Society Podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton. This was a really fun episode for me, getting the chance to talk to a creative director, prop manager, so many different roles, who was closely involved in two of the biggest additions to the theme park world. If you've gone to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Hogsmeade, Diagon Alley, or Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, you have seen the work of Eric Baker, who was closely involved in the props that made those lands come to life. And what I really got from talking to Eric is, especially with Star Wars, the way he approached the setting as a lifelong fan of the franchise and how important that is to him. And just... How much goes into every aspect, him talking about all the wiring from the 747 that they took, so much more than I even realized, but you sense it. You sense it when the care is given to these lands. Let's get right into it. Here is Eric Baker. Eric, thank you so much for talking with me. You are so welcome. I'm glad to be here. Oh, yeah. It's great. I often talk to people that worked on things that from years and years ago, which is fun. But it's really cool to talk to somebody who's worked on you know, lands that have opened pretty recently and that are just so popular. Yeah. So it's very yeah, cool. Well, it's pretty you. rare. Yeah. So I know you also, before you worked in themed entertainment and everything, worked at film and TV. But I'm curious even before that like how you got interested even in working in this film and entertainment industry, kind of as you were growing up and then going to school and everything. Well, you know, of course, like a lot of people uh, of my generation, you know, I, I was a kid and saw Star Wars and it kind of changed my life. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I said, I want to do that. And then at the same time, I was a huge fan of the Muppets. I, I loved anything that Jim Henson did. So I actually got into doing... Uh, puppet shows when I was a kid, like I would go, I think I was in third grade, maybe second grade even. And I would go around to classrooms and put on puppet shows with puppets that I had made and stuff. And, and so that was kind of my earliest uh, uh, start at this uh, showbiz thing, I guess. You mentioned Star Wars, which I know I was born a year before it came out. So I didn't see the original, but you know, I saw Empire and Return of the Jedi in the theater. It made an impact on me, but I, I'm i sure, given what you ended up doing, like, what was it about Star Wars that kind of led you on this path um, to where you ended up? I, well, you know, I think I was fascinated, uh, I mean, not only by the story, but the design of everything. I just, as a kid, I just remember loving everything, you know, the, the land speeders and the TIE fighters, next wing fighters and the droids, just the, you know, the amazing production design of the film just really impressed me as a kid. I mean, before that, the only thing or the very first thing I remember as a kid affecting me from a design standpoint was, uh, and, and I saw this in reruns, not originally, but the, uh, the Adam West Batmobile was the first thing I ever remember going, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, then after that, Star Wars and, you know, to a point that, you know, all the, the you know, Kenner came out with the toys and everybody had the Star Wars toys, but the, the toys off the shelf weren't good enough for me and my brother. We we built our own play sets, you know, we, we would, you know, I remember we built a, a big Dagobah play set with a, a, you know, pool to crash our X-Wings into and, you know, we, we had to go over the top with this stuff. We, we just weren't happy enough with what we could buy out of the stores. Uh, my parents had an uh, old ping pong table, and and we turned that whole ping pong table into a battle of indoor play set. So it was like this giant, 
indoor place at the size of a, a ping pong table, you know? Uh, so it was, it was really fun. I, you know, we had, uh, um, at one time we'd had a model railroad set. So we had this one model railroad car that would, uh, dump logs. It was like, it would haul logs and then you would push a button and it would dump them. And so we made that, uh, on a hill and it would dump the logs and, <laughs> and crash into the ATSD walker and stuff like that. So, you know, we were very much into, even back then I was into the details on stuff, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had the official Dagobah and, it, you know, it had the little house and it had this yeah. weird quicksand, but you had to really use your imagination because that got old after about a half hour. So Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it did. It did. Well, I we're going to talk more about Star Wars a little later for sure, but I know you ultimately started working in film in TV um, in a few different ways. But I have to ask you about something I heard you mention on another show, which yeah. is um, before you worked, well before you ever worked at Disney and Imagineering or anything, you briefly were involved with Muppet Vision 3D in an interesting role. And I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I was. I was one of the earliest people uh, to play Sweetums, uh, the live character that comes out in Muppet 3D. I was one of the, I was, in fact, I think I was the first group that was trained to be like uh, backup Sweetums, I guess you would call it. So if they, if one of the, you know, main Sweetums didn't show up, they would pull us out and stick us in as a backup. And I actually only did that for a week. And then I got my first job in, in film production and jumped out of the, you know, theme park operations world into into film production. So it, it was fun, though. I mean, it was really, you know, like I said, I love the Muppets. And uh, so it, it was great to, to just get to, you know, to be Sweetums was, was great. It was really fun. So you were the backup, but what did you do if the real Sweetums showed up? Like, did you just hang out or how did that yeah, work? Yeah, you would just you would just hang out. I mean, they, they I mean, it was so... I got, I got to say, it's one of the easiest jobs I had. I mean, he he appears for you know thirty seconds in the whole production, pretty much, and so you would do a show and then have a show off, and then do a show and have a show off. So it was pretty, uh, you know, it was pretty sweet little job, you know. And you know, we had our green room that we would hang out in, and uh, it was it was fun. We, you know, I enjoyed doing it uh, for one one brief week. <laughs> yeah. but before that, I was. Uh, I actually did uh, tours of the animation studio uh, back when Hollywood Studios was MGM right. or Disney MGM, and they had an amazing uh, animation studio there. And so that was my main job at Disney uh, when I first graduated from college was giving tours of the animation studio. And then they briefly had a, a museum, which was where Pizza Rizzo is now based on the Rocketeer movie. And uh, they had all the props and costumes from the Rocketeer. And I was one of the curators of that museum, if you would. I, you know, walk around and ask, answer questions and stuff. But people had things they wanted to know about the Rocketeer. Uh, so that was my that was my brief. Basically, all that was about eight months of my life right after I graduated from college until I was able to break into film production. Well, excellent. Yeah, that's that's so interesting that you worked um, in that. I, I went to MGM a lot as a kid or even as a teenager, so I'm mm -hmm. very familiar with that. But let's move on to, you started working, I know you worked at Nickelodeon on shows yeah. like Double Dare and Clarissa Explains It All. What was it like? You worked as a prop fabricator, I believe. I was, and uh, that was, you know, it was one of the best experiences of, of my professional career Nickelodeon Studios Florida was very much a family, and, and we all, I mean, even when we weren't at work, the cast and the crew, everybody, we would hang out together. We really enjoyed just being, you know, being together. We were a group that was there trying to make great children's television, and everyone, you know, just enjoyed being together. Uh, recently, I saw uh, Melissa Joan Hart had, you know, put out a statement saying how, how we affected her life and and how we were such a family together and everything. And, you know, every Friday night we would go out to dinner together after we finished taping Clarissa and stuff. And it was, it was just a really fun experience. And uh, I would say it's actually, I kind of hate it was my first experience in film production because it was, it made everything else hard to, <laughs> to live up to after that, you know, because we, it was such a, just such a great group of people to work with. And I mean, overall, I mean, I think I, I counted it up one time and, 
I did over a thousand episodes of children's television at Nickelodeon uh, in the basically 10 years I was there. And so it, almost any live show that was done in the early 90s, I worked on. And then, uh, you know, I also, you know, did things, I jumped over to Mickey Mouse Club and, and you know, worked with Brittany and Christina and Justin, all those guys when they were little, you know, snotty nosed kids. And uh, so it, it was, you know, just a, a blast. I mean, children's television was a lot of fun. And, and you know, after that, actually, this is something that's not really out there much, but uh, I had a, a friend of mine from college, uh, Brian Bain, who directs television commercials. Well, we created a couple of children's television shows and spent time, uh, you know, traveling between L.A. and New York, pitching and trying to sell shows. The act- Actually, the first one we pitched, we sold it, uh, a show called The Great Adventures of Gator and Satch. And uh, uh, we sold it to Scholastic Productions, who did Magic School Bus and mm-hmm. Goosebumps and stuff like that. And so we spent about a year developing it and then shot a pilot for it. And uh, the pilot actually starred uh, Ted Lange, who played Isaac the bartender on The Love Boat. <laughs> and uh, he played a retired blues singer. And the whole thing was the whole show taught kids about just getting out of your hometown and seeing the world. It was kind of a travel show for kids. And like when Mr. Rogers would go to the piano factory and see our pianos made, it was kind of a whole series based on that. But uh, uh, it was, it was really fun. Unfortunately, it never went anywhere, but we did uh, have a great time doing it. And it kind of, once again, it kind of spoiled this because it was the first time we tried selling a show (laughs) and we sold it and we're like, wow, this is easy. Anybody can do it. And then we never sold another show after that. (laughs) That's so interesting. Did you anticipate you were going to work in that zone, like children's television, everything for good? Or did you, does that kind of the way you were thinking at the time? No, I didn't. I mean, I was, you know, my desire was to, you know, work for industrial light and magic and build models and creatures for ILM was what I wanted to do. And in fact, I still have, uh, my rejection letter that they sent me when I applied for a job there. Uh, I've, I've held on to that just because I love the ILM uh, letterhead that it came on. And they were very polite and basically said, in this business, it's who you know as much as what you can do. So uh, so I, I never, uh, unfortunately, you know, CGI came along and I, I never got to uh, do creatures and, and oh. models. Uh, but I, I got to do a lot of that with children's television. And that's, that's why I was a got into being a fabricator because I, I it goes back to my Star Wars playsets I used to build. I guess I mean I I learned as a kid how to build things. My mom was an art teacher and my dad was a, a building contractor, and so I knew construction and then I knew how to build crafty things because of my mom. And so yeah, being being a fabricator on those shows, I, I would never never give that up. That was such a great experience. Well, yeah, I think it did lead into some of the work you did in the future with theme parks. Mm-hmm. Before we move to Universal Creative, I did want to ask you, this is really just a question for me. The listeners probably don't aren't as interested, but you worked on the miniseries From the Earth to the Moon, which yeah. I, especially when it came out at the time, was just really into watching. So I've curious a little bit, I believe they shot some of it in Florida, like that was a Universal Orlando, yeah. which, you yeah. know, at the time they were trying, both Disney and Universal were trying to build up that mm-hmm. that setup there. But I'm curious what you did on that or what that experience was like. Um, I was part of the special effects department and we were actually nominated for an Emmy Award uh, for our work on that, and uh, which was something I was very proud of. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, we we ended up losing. We didn't win. But, uh, but the experience of doing that show was... First of all, that was my first union job. I had to join the union to do it. And uh, it was absolutely amazing because I, I, I love uh, the space program. I, I've always, I mean, one of my very first memories as a child is my mom, you know, sitting me in front of the TV and making me watch Neil Armstrong step off onto the, the surface of the moon. And uh, so I've just always been a, a huge fan of the space program. And so with Earth to the Moon, it was actually... 99% of it was filmed in Orlando and in Central Florida. Uh, the, the stuff on the moon's surface was actually filmed in California in an aircraft hangar. It was the only place we could find a big enough space that didn't have like columns, support columns and stuff going up to the ceiling so they could get wide shots, you know, vistas of the moon from this, uh, this giant hangar uh, in California that we shot in. 
but yeah, just getting to go to Kennedy Space Center and go to places that civilians never get to see was was just amazing for me. You know, we one of the coolest places we went was we went to the Mercury Mission Control, which had been at the time and had been sealed up like a tomb since the '60s, and we were like the first people to go in there in years, and it was. You know, just like it was when, you know, they launched Alan Shepard and, and, you know, the original Mercury 7, you just walk in there and you could almost still smell the cigarette smoke in the air. And 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 it was just such an amazing place to, to get to visit uh, and to, to see because not many people in the world have, have got to see that. And uh, it was it was really cool. Now, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of the space program. I was, you know, I did, I, when I was growing up, it was the shuttle, but still going back and learning about all, and things like from the Earth to the Moon when I saw them, the effects in that for the time were, were incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially for what was considered HBO, yeah. HBO was not what it is now. It was very different to have something that high end as yeah. far as effects. Oh, and then just the just the pedigree of that show. I mean, Tom Hanks producing it, Ron Howard producing it. You know, they were just amazing people to work with, and and just the level of talent that they brought in for that show. Um, you know, a lot of the guys went on from there uh, to do Band of Brothers, and uh, while we were shooting that, Tom actually took off for a couple of months uh, to go over to England and film Saving Private Ryan while we were shooting Earth to the Moon. Wow. But you know, I'll never forget the day. I or one part of my job was making sure that every 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 readout in the space capsules read exactly what they were supposed to read at that point in time, and making sure that all the countdown clocks and everything in Mission Control read exactly what it was supposed to read at that point in time. And it's like nobody, except for the astronauts or people that worked in Mission Control, would realize that that stuff was <laughs> right. But that's how detailed we were with it. Um, I would have breakfast every morning with Dave Scott, who was one of the Apollo astronauts, also one of the Gemini astronauts, right. flew with, uh, with Neil Armstrong and Gemini. And you know, Dave and I would sit there, and he would he would tell me what the dials needed to be reading, and you know, and so I would go and program everything in so it was exactly right for for each take uh, for that point in time. Wow, that that's amazing. I'm going to hold off on asking any more just because there's so many other things to cover. I think we could just go, okay, we're going to veer over here. No, no, we're going to continue, but I, I uh, that's all really cool to hear. Yeah, Dave Scott yeah. from Apollo 15, I believe. Yeah, and um, yeah. just really, really cool stuff. Well, after all that fun that you had doing TV and film and everything, you actually made the decision to switch gears and move into themed entertainment and join Universal. So... I'm curious what led you to do that and then how the experience was of joining kind of a theme park company. Well, it's funny. It was it was really kind of a, a financial decision more than anything. The, the film industry in Florida kind of migrated to Georgia and to Louisiana because they were offering massive tax incentives for you to come there to film. And so our business was slowly starting to to not really die. I mean, there's still a lot of production here, but it just wasn't what it used to be. And, uh, you know, I got a call from a friend of mine, a, a guy, uh, David Kaler, who was one of the art directors I had worked with in the film business. And he said he was building models for Universal Creative and, uh, you know, asked if I wanted to come in and be a model builder because of my fabrication background with props and stuff. So I, you know, said, absolutely, I would love to do that. And I, I came in and, and started out, uh, you know, model building was kind of an entry level position at the time into into the theme park design industry, and so I came in and and started out as a model builder um, with Universal Creative, and uh, you know did several projects with them, and then one day, and I don't know if we want to segue right into Potter, but well, let's uh, let's do it. Let's segue right. Uh, unless you have something you want to mention before. Let's, no, no, no. They, why uh, not? Why not go to the big one? Yeah. <laughs> So the model building led me to, you know, I got a call from them one day because I wasn't on staff at the time. I was working as a, a freelancer. And uh, so they called and said, hey, we need somebody to come in and, and build a model of a castle for us. I said, okay, sure, I'm available. I'll do it. And um, I went in and I didn't know that much about Harry Potter. I knew it was some kids' books is all I knew. And I think I'd maybe seen the, I think the first two films were out. I think I had seen the first film. 
So I showed up and, and you know, after I signed my life away on, on non-disclosures, uh, it, was, it was Harry Potter and they wanted me to build a model of Hogwarts. And uh, so I spent two years uh, building concept models for Hogsmeade and for Forbidden Journey. On Forbidden Journey, I actually uh, helped design some of the scenes, uh, like the, the, the scene with the dragon uh, and the covered bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really hard for the designers to figure out how to draw that. So I built it as a model, and then they came in and photographed my model and, and turned it into what became the build drawings. So and I said, when the time comes, I would really like to be the decorator on this project. Uh, you know, I said, my background in film is, you know, props and set dressing. And, and you know, he kind of said, okay, yeah, well, and, yeah, you know, go away, kid, leave me alone. And uh, two years later, you know, they came back to me and said, hey, are you still interested in being the decorator? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And, and so they offered me the job to be the decorator on the, the first Harry Potter it was funny, they had never had an in-house person doing that type of thing before. So I kind of got to make up my own job description and uh, got to make up my own title. So that's where the prop manager came from. I kind of took prop master from the film industry and changed it into manager for, uh, for theme parks. And uh, that was a life-changing experience for me. Um, you know, first of all, getting to work with the amazing film crew from the Potter films. Um, you know, I, I was on set for the filming of the last three movies for Half-Blood Prince and the two Deathly Hallows films. And so just getting to learn from these guys and, and just see the incredible art they were creating, you know, was just amazing. And then Stephanie McMillan, who was the Academy Award-winning decorator on the Potter films, uh, but yeah, Stephanie McMillan took me under a wing and, and taught me how to do Harry Potter, you know? And so I spent a lot of time, you know, going to England and, and shopping for props and set dressing. And I would meet Stephanie and Rosie Goodwin, who was the shopper uh, for the films. And, and we would, you know, travel around England buying props and set dressing for Harry Potter. You know, at the same time, um, we had vendors that were working for us, uh, you know, building props and stuff that I convinced Universal to let me bring in some film fabricators and some film painters to help me fabricate and, and paint everything to the level that would be expected, you know, from a motion picture of that quality. So that's how I, you know, I ended up starting a, a small in-house shop that, you know, fabricated the majority of the props and set dressing and, and brought that world to life. And, you know, I, I think, me being naive to the theme park business and, and never decorating for a theme park is part of what made it so amazing because I, I didn't know when to stop. You know, I just we kept adding stuff and adding stuff, you know, right up until guests walked through the door. You know, we I don't think we really, I don't think any of us really knew if we had done it right or not until the first time that they let guests into the castle. And I went and stood in the portrait hall, kind of in the shadows of the portrait hall and watched people come through and there were these two girls, you know, it's Florida, it's 100 degrees outside. They had on the robes and their sweaters and carrying their wands. And they walked into the portrait hall and, and just dropped to their knees and started crying. And I was like, wow, we, we did it. We really did it. They love it. <laughs> and uh, so I don't think we really do until, or I didn't know until that moment that we had really touched the fans so much in, in what we did. Well, yeah, I mean, that was before galaxy's edge pandora even diagon alley there was no yeah. real precedent for that mm -hmm. for a land like of with that level of detail yeah. uh, i mean i'm not sure they're still i mean those other places are great and we're going to talk about i mean all of them are amazing and built on this but this yeah i don't know how much i mean you mentioned that you had involvement with um you work with the creative team and they gave a lot of direction but the mm -hmm. land just feels so right to the films i mean as you started bringing props in and everything like like, how did the creative process evolve where it ended up being that it everything just kind of fit into place so well? With Hogsmeade and with Diagon, we had a lot to draw on from the films, but the books are so rich, too. You know, there's so much stuff mentioned in the books. I mean, just like the foods and the product and things that, that J.K. Rowling came up with, you know, we were able to really take what had been seen in the films and then expand on it a little bit. So we kind of used the films as a jumping off point. And then we were able to, 
you know, really put a lot of detail into these buildings and stuff that, that wasn't seen in the films. And that was, you know, that was really exciting for me from a creative standpoint, you know, just getting to come up with these, especially like in Dumbledore's office and the dark art, the dark arts classrooms, one of my favorites, because we kind of, we kind of made it a mishmash of all the dark arts classrooms from the films. And, and we just got to build some really cool stuff. Uh, Dave Hyde, who was my lead fabricator, was just like our mead, you know, my mad scientist guy. And he would just come up with the greatest devices and, you know, telescopes and microscopes and shrunken, not, well, not shrunken heads, but uh, skulls under jars and, and stuff like that. You know, it was just, just really fun. And, and, you know, the, the one thing that, the main thing that Stephanie taught me, you know, she, she said the real world is cluttered. The real world is layer upon layer of stuff. And so that's really what we went for. And the goal for me was every time a guest comes back is to see something different. You never see the same stuff twice, I don't think. I mean, even when I go there now, I, I see things that I totally forgot about. It was just, uh, it was a great experience being able to do that. And, you know, all in all, in, in uh, Hogsmeade, there's about 35,000 pieces of props and set dressing that we put in there, which I think at the time was probably pretty unheard of. And we did, you know, kind of it, it raised the bar for the whole theme park industry. I mean, like, like you were saying, no one had ever done a completely immersive world like that before. When you're when you're in that world, you don't see the rest of the park around you. You know, you're you're in Hogsmeade. I mean, to the point, and I love this that you know, guests come and some people never leave Hogsmeade and Diagon. They spend their whole vacation there. <laughs> yeah. Which, which I love, you know, they, 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 they want to be in that world so much that they come there and literally spend their whole vacation just in those two worlds. Are there any specific details in either land, Hogsmeade or Diagon, that are like some of your favorites or something that a touch that you really like? Well, it's, I, I mean, I absolutely, I love Morgan and Burks and, uh, in Diagon and, or I'm sorry, Nocturne Alley. And then I also love the Weasley Brothers store because I was on set when they were filming that. And once again, Stephanie, the decorator from the films, took great care in putting that set together. And I, I was there and able to see her and her team build that and make it. And Stephanie, unfortunately, passed away from cancer while we were doing Diagon. So it was very important to me that we get that exactly right, because I knew how much set, how much that set meant to her. And, and we did. I mean, everything in there is... It's so accurate to the films down to the, I mean, we hired the same companies that made all the packaging for the films to build the packaging for it. And, you know, it was really a labor of, of love to, to get that store right uh, for Stephanie. Um, and then, you know, like I said, Morgan and Burks and, and Nocturne is uh, just like one of the scariest places. <laughs> we just had so much fun making it. You know, I went to my crew and I said, all right, guys, you know, for the next two weeks, everybody just build the, the scariest stuff you can come up with. And <laughs> as long as it fits into the Potter world. And so we really had a lot of fun uh, with that store. It was it was really a great experience doing that. Um, and, you know, when I'm working with my crews like that, I go back to, you know, unfortunately, I never got to work with Jim Henson. But everybody that I knew that worked with him, you know, just really talk about how he treated his crew just amazing and let everybody just be creative and, and have fun at what they're doing. And so I try to do that with my crews when I'm working with them and, and, you know, try to really let them have their artistic expression and, and do, you know, have fun at what they're doing. You know, don't, don't make it a job, you know, make it, make it fun for them. You know, I think that comes through though, in the lands too, when people, the teams are doing well, the lands are going to be better. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned, and so I know you worked on Hogsmeade, but then, you know, Hogsmeade ultimately appeared in other parks. You know, I went to the one in Hollywood recently, and then there's mm -hmm. Japan, but then also Diagon Alley, which I know you were involved with. And, you know, we'll, we don't have to be chronological here with yeah. different jobs and everything. But what did you learn as you went along that ultimately maybe led either with those lands, or, but especially with Diagon Alley that kind of then you took to that? And I mean, that is well, like takes the original Hogsmeade and just blows it up to something else <laughs> well, well diagon yeah diagon was i mean it's not often 
you get a chance to improve upon something you've done. And so Diagon was before Hollywood or Japan, uh, but you know Diagon was just a, a, a chance to take it to another level. And you know at that time I had, you know I had experience working with the film crew, uh, Pierre Bohanna and his team. You know I could call them up and say. I need some really cool broomsticks and they, they would, you know, build broomsticks for us or, you know, whatever we needed. And then, then there were great stores. Once again, like, like Morgan and Birch, for instance, you only saw small parts of that in the film, just very brief clips Mm -hmm. and getting to take what they had started in the film and then just expand on it and turn it into this huge, super cool place. You know, same thing, I mean, Ollivanders, you know, we had done Ollivanders in Hogsmeade, but then we did Ollivanders on steroids for Diagon and uh, got to got to really go crazy. And, I mean, I think there's 50,000 wine boxes in, Oliva- in Ollivanders and Diagon. Um, it's, you know, it was really fun to to get to do that stuff and then to do things like Hagrid's motorcycle, you know, in the, in Hogsmeade, we had done the Weasley's car, which came from the film. We, we got that one uh, from Warner brothers the, mm. that we had there. And then um, we wanted Hagrid's motorcycle, but we wanted people to be able to sit on it. Uh, so I was able to go to the manufacturer who built the original Hagrid's motorcycle and had them build one for the part, but you know, we had to make it guess safe and everything. Uh, so it was fun to get to to do stuff like that. The vault door in Green Guts, as you're just entering down, that vault door is a it belongs in a museum. It is a piece of art. It's uh, uh, built by a guy, a guy named Tom Gardner, who was one of our fabricators, and and it's just an absolutely beautiful piece of work. You know, another one is Wise Acres Wizarding Supply. I, I call it the Dave Hyde Museum. Because that was another one. I just turned turned Dave, my my mad scientist, loose and said, "Just make the coolest, most amazing telescopes you can come up with," and uh, while keeping it in that world, in the Potter world, you know, just every day, you know, if I had if I dreamed about something at night and I could come in the next morning and and say, "Hey guys, build this for me," it, it was. It's it's very rare that you get to have that opportunity where you've got these talented artists you know, at your fingertips that can build anything that you can think of. And, and so, it, you know, and it was a very collaborative effort too. I mean, everyone had input into what we were working on and building, I think. Well, before we shift gears, I did want to ask one more question, just kind of an yeah. overarching question. You know, you got to work on lands that I think are going to, you know, that are just, they don't feel like even hogs me does not feel like there are things that opened around that same time that are starting to age. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like it's aging, but looking back at it overall, I mean, what stands out to you or what are you most proud of or excited about when you look back on that time and what kind of you were able to do there on both lands? Well, I think, you know, with, with Hogsmeade, we really laid the ground for things that that would become Avatar or Star Wars or, you know, we, we did the groundwork for what has become uh, the trend in theme parks now to create to create these immersive worlds, and you know I think that's kind of how I ended up on Galaxy's Edge. Was you know Disney wanted their Harry Potter, and Robin Reardon, the executive producer on Galaxy's Edge, had uh, also worked on Hogsmeade, and she recognized the importance of the props and set dressing that we had done, and how it how it brought the world to life. So, you know, that's that's how I ended up on Galaxy's Edge is they, you know, she reached out to me and said, hey, we need somebody that can do what you can do. And I said, well, do you need somebody that can do what I can do on Star Wars? And she said, yeah, and I said, I'll be right there. So, <laughs> so Star Wars was my Harry Potter. That's what I grew up on. And so I, I had, uh, I couldn't, you know, it was a bucket list thing. I mean, I, I love Universal very much. And, and that's, you know, I look at Universal as family and I, I really hated to leave, but I, I could not, especially because I knew I, they were making the new films and I knew I would be on the Star Wars film sets. Uh, and that was, for me, that was something I just, I had to do it. You know, I couldn't turn it down. Yeah, well, let's go into Galaxy's Edge because, you know, there's so much to talk about there. Right up front, you just referenced it. I mean, visiting the sets because you know when galaxy i believe force awakens and you know that mm-hmm. I'm, i don't know the exact time that you were starting you know you had 
Force Awakens getting started. You know, Rogue One was coming into play at some point. So, I mean, what was it like to actually get there? And then, you know, Disney had bought Lucasfilm, and there's just so much happening at that time. Yeah, there, there was. There really was. Uh, yeah, so I was there for uh, Rogue One, Solo, and Episode Eight. Uh, they were filming. I mean, as soon as I signed on with Disney, they flew me to California. I, I met the team out there. And then they put me on a plane to England to go to Pinewood Studios where they were filming. Um, yeah, I guess it was episode eight. It was episode eight they were filming at the time. Um, you know, and the first thing they did, well, first of all, I walk into the production offices, into the art department, and it's like old home days. It's like I knew everybody there because the the film crew from Potter had rolled into Star Wars when Potter ended. So it was like I walked into the office and immediately knew everybody that was there working. And, uh, you know, they took me down to the costume shop and there was Pierre Bohanna who had built all of our broomsticks, now building, you know, Storm, Stormtroopers and C-3PO, you know. So that was just amazing because uh, it was kind of being back, you know, like being back with my uh, family, with my UK family again. And, uh, you know, the first set they took me to was the Millennium Falcon. And I walked in there and they said, oh, here you can, you know, sit in Han Solo's seat. And, you know, I got to sit in Harrison Ford's seat and it's all I could do to keep it together and not start, you know, crying or screaming or something. And I had all these Disney executives with me at the time. So you had to try and be cool and keep it together. Uh, but that was, that was just amazing getting to do that. And then, you know, we did the same process with that that I that we did with with Potter. I you know I I spent a lot of time with the film crew learning how they did it. We hired one of the shoppers from the film who took us to all the places where they bought things for the film. So we you know we were buying the same stuff. You know we wanted that accuracy just like we did with Potter that everything matched what you saw on film. And so we you know we bought everything at the same places that they bought them for the films. Um, you know which was you know, crazy because they use a lot of aircraft, scrap aircraft pieces and stuff. So, you know, we would take a train, you know, three hours outside of London and then get in a van and ride for another hour. And suddenly out in a cow pasture, there would be a 747 sitting there that they're stripping for parts. <laughs> and so, you know, you're going, it's like, uh, you know, how, how much wiring's in this 747? And, oh, I think there's 50 miles of wiring in each 747, oh, wow. is it? All right, create it up. I'll take all 50 miles. It's like I want it all. <laughs> you know, it was it was a totally different experience than Potter in that with Star Wars, you just have what's in the films, really. There's not the rich fiction that we had with Potter. So we got to make up a lot more stuff with Star Wars than we did for Potter, you know, uh, especially, you know, like inside the antiquarian, um, you know, Doc and Dar's place, we got to come up with, you know, what does the shelving look like in this world? And, you know, what do you hang your stormtrooper helmet on when you go, when the stormtrooper goes home at night, what does he hang his helmet on? You know, uh, things like that, you know, and then at the same time you get to tell stories. And, and that's one of the great things about doing props and set dressing is you're telling the stories through props and set dressing. And so I don't know if you've done the lightsaber experience there. I haven't only because of the cost, but it looks really yeah. cool. Yeah, no, I, I, I same, same here. <laughs> um, but when you first enter there, you go through a small vestibule, and then you go into the big saber workshop. But that small vestibule that you go in through, there's just so much storytelling going on in there. If you're able to, if if you get to stop and really look around, it really tells the story of Sabi, the 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 saber builder, and everything. And uh, and the, plus, there's just lots of really cool stuff in there. Uh, you know, biker scout helmets and and uh, like uh, Sabi's apron is hanging on the wall, and like the chest plate for the apron is made out of a biker scout chest plate. And so, you know, we we just had a lot of fun. The the uh, his desk. If you look at his work table, uh, if you look closely, there's a big orange sun on it. So it's actually the side off of a B wing fighter. Oh wow. Uh, and very few people will ever pick up on that stuff. But it's just fun to get to come up with those things and uh, and put it, you know, we try to, I do this stuff for the fans because I want them to enjoy it. 
And so we try to come up with as much stuff as we can, as many hidden things as we, as we can to, to really give the true fans, you know, things to look for when they're there. Given, like you said, with Potter, you have the films and books and Galaxy's mm-hmm. Edge is interesting too. One, it's gigantic. Both of them are. They're so big. Like I get lost in them sometimes because Disneyland, Disney World are backwards. So I end up going yeah. the wrong way. But also with it being a place that now they're kind of incorporating it into various stories, but was not mm-hmm. part of the films or anything. Yeah. Um, did you feel any added pressure when you're doing that to, you know, make sure it feels like star Wars. I mean, you have the star Wars fandom, but just yeah. is there added pressure with not, I mean, with something so new, I don't think so because I had once again, my crew that was working with me, uh, were such avid Star Wars fans too, and had been fabricating and building Star Wars stuff their whole life. Uh, it was really fun for them, just like it was for me to, to just come up with this stuff. And mm-hmm. and you know, we quickly built a trust with Lucasfilm and with Doug Chang, just like we did with Warner Brothers with Potter when they they saw that we really got it and we really understood it, and they they really just let us go crazy and do what we wanted to do and. You know, fortunately, since the films were in production, you know, if, if I had seen something on the film set that was really neat, you know, I could call them up and say, hey, can you, you know, send the, the mold of the giant blue fish hanging in the QSR uh, in the quick service restaurant? You know, can you send me the mold of that fish? We would like to, you know, put one. Uh, and that, that I don't even know if he ended up on film. He was for Solo originally. They did a, a chase through a fish market and... I think a little bit of it ended up in the film, but I don't know if that guy made it or not. But it was just something I had seen on set. You know, I have a lot of people, and this is one of my favorite things out there, and I, I've had a lot of people tell me this too, in the little wood carving area uh, in the in the market, there's an astromech droid that they're using for uh, a furnace. Uh, <laughs> it's like an astromech with his head off, and it's got a grill on top. And that was something that I just saw tucked in a corner on the on the solo set. And I was like, that is so cool. We've got to do that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we had to turn an astromech into a furnace uh, for the wood carver. You know, the, like the toy dairy and the toy shop, you know, there's lots of throwbacks to the Kenner toys in there. If you look, uh, there's like a giant version of Jabba's cell barge with all these little <laughs> figures. And, and that was I, on, on all these things I do, I try to get my... I still try to get my fabrication fingers in there every once in a while. So, so like I sculpted the Java that's in the cell barge and then a couple of the creatures that are, I think, uh, Oh gosh, I can't remember which other ones I did. I think I did a, a Greedo and a hammerhead maybe and a Thorian, I think, but you know, the, so that was kind of our tribute to our, our childhood, our, yeah. by, by doing our version of the Kenner play sets for the, for that world, you know, because, you know, in that world, these people may not know who Darth Vader was or, or Obi-Wan Kenobi, but they've heard the stories of of the battle between the Sith Lord and the Jedi and stuff like that. You know, like there's the marionettes of, of Darth Vader and Obi-Wan hanging in the toy shop and, and stuff like that. So we try to allude back to the films without making it too much right in your face, you know. So you mentioned this with Potter, but I suspect with Star Wars, I mean, how, you know, the opening date's coming and there's like a deadline. How do you get yourself to stop just constantly putting more things in or like you (laughs) said, coming up with new ideas? Because there was so much space and there's not even just like the ride queues or anything. There's, like you said, there's multiple shops. There's, you know, the bar, the quick service. There's so many places to put things. Well, it's, it's literally, they're like, okay, we're dropping the rope. The guests are coming in. You've got to quit. Get out. Get out. Uh, because, I mean, that's with, with, with Potter and with Star Wars. I mean, we were, we were the last ones there. I mean, putting stuff in place right up to the last second. And uh, in, in some cases, we may have even been there after it opened and, and still adding a few things mm-hmm. here and there. You know, because you kind of, once the guests come in, you can kind of see how they interact with stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you change things around just a little bit to, you know, help with the traffic flow or things like that yeah. through the park. But yeah, generally, you know, our guys are the last ones out because they're, you know, we're, we're really tweaking stuff right till the very end. Mm-hmm. Are there any, I mentioned this with Potter, but are there any little touches you haven't mentioned yet that you just uh, really are proud of or enjoy from Galaxy's Edge? Well, I, I mean, I love 
the antiquarian. I mean, that that's like my, I guess my love song to Star Wars because there's everything I could think of from every film. Uh, like I tried putting every helmet I could think of in there. Uh, you know, every blaster we could think of. Uh, and and the hard thing, and, you know, the hard thing about Star Wars is that the fans have been building this stuff for you know forty five years. Yeah. So to try and do better than they've done was a big challenge because I mean the the stuff that the fans produce is amazing. And there were a couple of instances where we actually bought stuff from fans that we met at conventions and stuff. We're like, wow, you know, that's an amazing piece you made and, and without telling them who we were or what we were doing. So they, they probably still don't know where their stuff is actually at, but we're like, <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Could we buy one of those from you? And and like, uh, I can't tell you what it's for. <laughs> yeah. Sign this NDA. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I love, I just love docking darts because I mean, literally other than the shell of the building, everything in there is, is ours. I mean, uh, you know, all the shelving units on the wall, the, the, a lot of the, the shelving that this, that the artifacts are sitting on is, uh, rifle racks, uh, military rifle racks that we cut up into pieces and turned into, into shelving units. And, uh, you know, getting to just doing the, the taxidermied animals in there, um, you know, we had a couple of amazing special effects artists that we hired to make those creatures. Uh, you know, the the giant wampa and all that. Just because that that kind of game, you know, kind of I kind of got to do what I had always wanted to do as far as building creatures for ILM and stuff, and and building props for ILM. So that that was just just yeah, everything in, in Doc and Dars. And then that was right when uh, I think the Mandalorian premiered right when Galaxy's Edge opened. And, you know, we had reached out to the Mandalorian production team and said, is there anything you guys are doing that we can put in Dockendars that could be an artifact in Dockendars? Straight from John Favreau, they said, well, you, you got to have Mando's helmet and blaster in there. And I'm like, well, that means that sometime in the future, somehow Dockendar ends up with Mando's helmet and blaster hanging <laughs> in his shop. So I keep... You know, my fingers crossed that some sometimes sometime that'll become a story point in, in some <laughs> uh, Star Wars TV show or something uh, where, where Doc is able to get his hands on the, the Amanda's helmet and blaster. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. When uh, when I was at Disneyland, I you know, I saw Amanda there. So, you know, <laughs> they've already got the character now walking around. But but yeah. in the show, you know, I'm curious for your fandom because you know, for a long time, you know, we had just the three films and then mm -hmm. We had the prequels, and now you've got, you know, Mandalorian, and then um, Andor, and Ahsoka, right. and and you know, plus there were Clone Wars and everything else. Like, how has your fandom evolved with seeing this kind of, and not to mention Galaxy's Edge getting to work on it? You're kind of this explosion of Star Wars that happened for a while. I'm loving it. I mean, I I love the new series. That you know, I I really enjoy watching them. Um, we actually got to contribute to one of the episodes of of Ahsoka. We got to make a, a helmet, or well, I got a call from Lucasfilm saying, you know, there's one of the helmets in Doc and Dars that uh, it, it was actually Ezra Bridger's Biker Scout helmet, and they said, you know, did you, did you do you know who built it? And I said, well, we did. And they said, can you do another one in a week? And we said, absolutely. So, <laughs> so uh, George Gacomas, who was my lead scenic painter painted it up and we shipped it out there. And so Ezra's helmet that you see in, uh, in Ahsoka came from us, which was really cool. You know, I, I can really keep hoping that, you know, at some point Batu's going to show up. Well, it's already shown up in some of the animated, the new animated series, uh, little bits and pieces of Batu. Uh, so, you know, I really keep hoping one of the live action shows will end up there at some point. It would make sense, you know, especially as, you know, they're still popular and there's going to be a Mandalorian movie. They just announced the date today as we're recording this. So, yeah. I mean, there's, I don't think it'll be in the movie, but I'm just saying there's so many different shows and elements that I think yeah. um, it would be cool. Is there anything like from your fandom, this is not as a, some of your work, <laughs> but is there something you'd love to see at a Disney theme park or even in Galaxy's Edge, like an attraction or something that um, would be fun to see that you've always thought that would be cool to see in a theme park. Wow, from the Star Wars world, that's hard to hard to say. Um, 
there's just so much. I mean, I, I would love I would love to see Olga's cantina filled with creatures, you know, like yeah. the cantina from the film. I, I would love to see that. And I would love to see more droids running around. Yeah, I can't think of anything specifically. I mean, if, you know, if you could drive your own land speeder or something, maybe that would be <laughs> cool. You'd be able to rent a land speeder for the day and cruise around the... Oh, my park. gosh. And there'd be so many people wanting those land speeders. I know, I know. <laughs> It'd be harder than, like, getting a virtual queue now or something. On something. Yeah, but, yeah, for sure. But, no, those are great. I, I put you on the spot. I hadn't even mentioned yeah. that before. But I do... Ogas, that is a thing. It's so small in there, but if it was bigger and you could have, like, a bartender that was a creature or something. I mean, there's, you know, and they just had some new droids today in Disneyland as we're recording this. It's pretty crazy, but I'd like to see a lot more. So I'm with you on that. Well, last yeah. question about Galaxy's Edge, just okay. kind of an overarching, I asked a similar question on Potter, but as a Star Wars fan, I know this kind of sits differently. You know, how do you look back on Galaxy's Edge now, now that it's, that it's finished and you worked on it and it was such a big project. Like if you go there or think about it, how do you look at it as a fan? You know, I wish we could have done more. I, I, I mean, I would have. I, I wish the land were fuller. I wish we could have had time to do more props and dressing and put more cool stuff in there. You know, there's an, an enormous amount of things there, but I think the more there is, the more the world becomes real. And and that, um, you know, with Potter, we were able to achieve that. But with with Galaxy's Edge, there's so much of the Star Wars world has to be fabricated. You know, it, it's familiar. It's all stuff from our world, so it's familiar to you, but it still has to be fabricated. And having to fabricate everything from scratch is a lot more expensive than being able to go out and shop and buy antiques and, and just do some slight modifications to antiques and stuff like we did for Potter. Uh, so I wish we had had the opportunity to to add a little bit more to it. Mm-hmm. Um you know, but then there were things, you know, like getting to, you know, decorate or, you know, help bring the Millennium Falcon to life. Uh, you know, Brad Ringhausen, who was the guy who, who dressed the Millennium Falcon for us, did an amazing job. And then, you know, the Rise of the Resistance queue line is amazing. I wish we could have gotten everything to the level of the Rise of the Resistance queue line because there's so much stuff to see in there. And, you know, I love going on the, the blogs and fan sites and, and seeing when they, you know, find things that we put in there and 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 really pick up on stuff, you know, like, you know, Nathaniel Gerhardt, who was in charge of the Q of the Rise Q line, did a great job. Also, um, you know, one of the coolest things uh, I got to give Adam Savage a tour of both Galaxy's Edge and Potter uh, in one in one day, uh, and when I took him in the Galaxy's Edge. The thing he pointed out was all the cabling that runs overhead because there's I can't remember how much there's there's over 50 miles of cabling uh, in Galaxy's Edge and and he, and that was the thing he picked up on. He's like, "You guys nailed it with that." He's like, "My job at ILM was doing all the cabling on the buildings, and you guys really got it right." <laughs> uh, so that was. Uh, um, Kristen Ziegler, who was in charge of that, and her her and her team just did an amazing job uh, with that. Yeah, well, it feels lived in, and I know there's, I'm sure there's always more things, but like you mentioned, the queues, um, especially that Smuggler's Run, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run queue, I've spent a lot of time in that standby queue, yeah. and it doesn't feel that long because... One, there's like audio and stuff, but there's so much, so many things to look at in that queue, which yeah. I was like, how did 45 minutes go by or whatever? So <laughs> it's, it's a great job. Yeah. Rise of the Resistance, I, um, you know, haven't spent as much time in the queue, but now it's like, I need to go back and maybe do that just to check out all the stuff. Maybe now that it's not so long, I like, it's not three hours or anymore. So it's, yeah. that's, that's awesome. Well, my goodness, Eric, this has been really cool. But I know right now you're working for Universal, so I just have you know you you have a you've been there in the past. I'm just curious, like how cool it is for you now to be back working at Universal Creative, based on just what you've done there in the past, and you know what are you excited about just overall? I mean, uh, everything we're doing at Universal right now is uh, epic, you might say, <laughs> and uh, getting to you know Universal is my home. Uh, that. Those guys are my family, and and I've just always enjoyed working with them. Just the uh, an incredible place to work, and uh, so I'm really happy to be back. And 
you know, we've got a whole new generation of, of kids coming up now that are, you know, learning to do this stuff. And, and it's great to work, uh, you know, with a lot of the younger people and, and really get to teach them how to do what we've done and be able to pass this along to the next generation. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving, I'm really loving being back uh, where I'm at and, you know, working with people that were there when I started, you know, and, and uh, it's just, it's just a great experience. That's excellent. I'm very excited about, well, the things you've worked on in the past, but also I'm sure what's to come. Um, this has been so great. Thank you, Eric. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, thanks so much for being on the show. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. This has really been a, a good time. Well, that was really cool. If you enjoyed this episode, there are a few other podcast interviews that Eric's done really more focused just on Star Wars, including the Blast Points podcast. That one in particular I enjoyed and listened to before talking with Eric. You should definitely check that out. Also, he has a segment in the One Day at Disney series on Disney+. Plus where he talks a bit, he walks around Galaxy's Edge, talks about his fandom. If you're curious to kind of see a video version of what he was talking about with Star Wars, that is also definitely worth checking out. Eric was such a cool guest, and I really enjoyed it. And if you like this and haven't listened to all the past episodes, there are 229 past episodes of the Tomorrow Society podcast. Oh my lord, that's a lot. But you can go back, all the way back to the beginning, through whatever podcast provider you use, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, whatever you use, you can go back. Lots of former Imagineers, people that worked at Disney, at Universal, others that worked on Galaxy's Edge. So many cool people. You can also go to TomorrowSociety.com slash podcast with an S at the end to check those out. Always appreciate hearing from you, too. If you go back and listen to those episodes, shoot me an email, Dan at TomorrowSociety.com. I would love to hear what you think of them because I notice sometimes people are going back and listening to early episodes and they are the type where for the most part, they're kind of evergreen. So I feel like you could go back and listen to shows from four or five years ago, easy, and it's not going to play that differently than now for sure. If you would like to help support this listener driven podcast, there are no sponsors. There are no ads jumping in the middle of the interviews. Part of the reason that I'm able to do that is through your support through Patreon. You can become an official member of the Tomorrow Society, get access to some really cool perks, learn more at patreon.com slash Tomorrow Society, or you can just buy me a Dole Whip. I was recently at Walt Disney World, hope to get back at some point. Always enjoy that. Go to tomorrowsociety.com slash Dole Whip to learn more. If you would like to check out what's happening with Tomorrow Society, you can do so on many social media pages. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, whatever it's called now, Blue Sky Threads, I am out there. Go out and follow the show. It really helps to spread the word. And wherever you can, tell others that you listen to the latest episode. The music that you are hearing right now was written by Adam Hookie, performed by the Sophisticated Babies. Thank you so much for listening to this interview with Eric Baker. And I will talk to you again very soon.